the, the picture that I pulled up last okay. week, because when we had the adjunct, level curves, there's nothing higher. the vectors get longer when the level curves are closer together, but when they're further apart and you're on a relatively flatter part of the surface, the vector shrinks because the steepness goes smaller. And when you're on the top, you're technically, you have no steepness because you're at that instant, you're at level, level ground. So is it like a plus or minus thing for T? Then when we have a, lo a local max and a local min on a 3D surface, is it, is it plus or minus then? Whatever plus or minus T makes it, makes the k component of the zero vector. For the, the T, for when we plug in, for at what time, you know, that. Oh, oh, so, so you're, not, you're, not, you're not using the parameter T. Parameter T is for a curve in space, but this is for a surface, which is the function of X and Y. Okay. So you're saying at the X, Y coordinate, Yes. Where you're at the maximum, well, you, you would be finding the x value and the y value in the domain that gives you that maximum. Okay, for the position. it's just like in, in calculus one, when you're trying to find the maximum of a function, you set the first derivative equal to zero to find your critical points, and you solve that equation for x because you're looking for x values of the domain that give you that peak or that valley on the curve. Okay, in three dimensions, you're looking for a peak or a valley on the surface, and it's now a function of two variables. So you're wanting to find the x y values in the domain that correspond to those z-coordinates where your, your valleys and your peaks occur. Okay, okay, so, thank you. So, and you can use gradient logic to find those points. You really want to find the places where the gradient goes to zero. I think was now I know test. where I know you from. <laughs> yeah. I saw you yesterday in the parking lot. I, I, I know him, oh, I know him oh, yeah. but I've only seen him a couple of times, so this is where I know you from. And I'm doing, I keep referring to your pronoun until I know your name. Matt. 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 Matthew. Yes, sir. Chauncey. Nick. Jared, Danielle, uh, you told me you're Chris. Tim. 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 You're Chris. And I'm pointing, that's very rude. <laughs> <laughs> but just just my little memory tool. Tim, Chris, I have yet to introduce myself to you. Kyle. Kyle. Yeah. I know you, but again, you're a pronoun until I you remind me of your name. Andrew. A have we worked together before? Yeah. Because you look familiar. Yeah. Okay, Andrew, Kyle, Chris, Tim. Yes, sir. Jacob. Jacob. Dylan. 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 Jacob. Chris. Tim. Kyle. <laughs> Andrew. 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 Sorry. Gosh, I'm such a jerk. <laughs> and I don't want to your name. Matt. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm gonna. That's gonna happen. Well, it takes a lot. Of, yeah, yeah. It takes a lot of taking up papers and handing back papers to help the mnemonics kick in with their names. With, um, okay, so so some questions that have popped up tonight is, um, well, put the document camera up here, <laughs> is calendar-wise, luckily we're still on track with this with this new makeshift calendar. And I finally posted a copy of it on our D2L page. I completely forgot to do that. Um, and the copy that I posted on D2L has my contact information in my office and email and office hours at the top of it. Um, but we're still on track to, to, to be finished with test three's material by next Thursday night, the 9th. So to allow you time to sort of assimilate that and to, to work on any kind of review information or problems that I give you, um, I'll probably put test three in the testing center beginning Saturday the 11th and then have it in there that Saturday, the following Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Tuesday and Wednesday will be good. Well, not Tuesday so much for you because you're here late at night, but Wednesday they're open till 7.30 also. So if you had to wait to the last minute, I don't recommend it, but if you had to wait to the last minute, you, you've got that. Wednesday is a robust day to take it. 11 to when? So that will be 11, 13, 14, and 15. But I'll, I'll make a, the proper announcement when, once we finish the test three material. So we're still on track to, to get everything done um, by then and hopefully everything else for the rest of the semester. If you've had a chance to take a look at this, um, if you notice the bulk of test four's material, I don't get from the textbook. I'm not really a big fan of the way our textbook covers the, um, the vector calculus chapter, chapter 15. And I've already I've got the sections up here that would pair with those corresponding parts of the textbook. But in all honesty, once we're finished with the polar stuff, the polar double integrals in 15.4, and we start the cylindrical and the other stuff for the remainder of test four, you can either sell your textbook or just go ahead and put it on the shelf. Because that's the remainder of the stuff I'm going to use is supplemental material. Um, how many of you got a chance to go to D2L and print off the pre- done notes. Andrew. Andrew. Andrew has a copy of them. Chris has a copy of them. A handful of you already got a copy of them. Um, I mentioned them last week and if you if you so choose 
every one of these sets of lecture notes that I post on D2L, I mean, they're, they're basically just a lecture outline for what I want to cover in class that night. It's got, you know, some handy pictures, some handy diagrams, some definitions, and, you know, just a lot of verbiage that, you know, goes along with the lesson. But the main, the main beauty is, you know, when I want to work a problem, I leave some deliberate space here for you to work the problem along with me in your notes. And when I'm finished with class, this will be scanned in and dated March 31st for what we covered for the, the D-test, section 14.7. Um, and you'll see what the D-test is as part of tonight. Um, at the end of this, at the end of each one of these little blank lecture note outline things, I put an optional homework assignment here. Um, these are problems that I've written up that, that I like. And, okay. and I'm making out your tests <laughs> from now on for the rest of the semester. So take that for what it's worth. I will post the solutions to these. Um, so it's, it's you know, some standard problems on how to find the maximum and minimum values. Remember in Calculus 1 when you're, when you're doing the first derivative test to get your maxes and your mins, and then sometimes you can use the, hey, you remember this. Come on, dust off the cortex there. And the second derivative test to, to say concave up means I'm at a minimum, concave down means I'm at a maximum, and stuff like that. It's been a while, but we're, we're visiting the Calculus 3 analog of that tonight, how to find critical points, points on a, on a 3D surface where you have a, a, a peak or a valley, your maxes and your mins. And then the D test that I keep referring to is the actual test, kind of like the, the second derivative test to see, you know, if your, max, if, your, if your critical point is at the top of a concave down portion, it's a maximum. If it's the bottom of concave up, you're at a minimum. So it's, a, it's essentially just a, a count three version of the second derivative test. Um, so I've got some regular problems here, similar to the ones you see in your textbook. You're welcome to do the textbook homework. I'm not trying to slough it off. Um, if you really want to be solid, to do the textbook and this, and get you know really well practiced with it. Um, you also revisit some of the optimization things that you did in Calculus One. You know some of the problems in Calculus One that were kind of like this was you know here's here um, you have a box that has a fixed surface area, a fixed amount of material to make a box. What is the largest volume you can make? with you know, 20 square feet of material or something like that. And so you had to make a function of one variable that represents the volume of this box and then find its critical points, see where the max volume occurs and things like that. Um, you're just going you know, to higher dimensions because now you can use two variables in, in calculus three. So I've got, so, so, so this is sort of like a supplemental homework and it's your option to do it. But in all honesty, this is really good to use as a review in preparation for the test because again, I like these problems, I wrote up these problems, I'm making out your test, put two and two together. Right. <laughs> um, we've already covered the, the section on gradient and directional derivatives, which was 14.5, and we've also covered the chain rule from 14.6. I, I just hand wrote the notes for that. If you want to see the, the problems from those sections too, I can get those put up on D2L so you can basically have a, a set of review problems to look at. And again, uh, the, where this appears on our D2L page, is when you go to our D2L page, your D2L page is getting a little fuller as we go through. Um, I've made a little module here that says blank lecture notes, optional for class, and it's got the remaining of what we need for test three. Test three stops right here. So this is tonight, this is Thursday night of this week, and part of Tuesday night of next week, and then this is part of Tuesday and Thursday night of next week also. So we'll finish test three's material with those three topics, and I'll go back and, and, and upload the stuff in 14.5 and 14.6. Um, so when I do the answers, my answers probably handwritten work. I'll probably wedge those in between here, like here I'll put the solutions to the 14.7 supplement homework, here I'll put the solutions to this supplement homework, because each one of these, um, I've tried to follow suit with, with each one of them. They have the, the setup for the notes, the, the space to work out the problems, and you know, plenty of examples that I work in class. And then, well, heck, this one, I don't have my supplemental problems. Where do I get those from? Okay, I'll figure out where they went because they were supposed to be at the bottom of the notes. So that's that's embarrassing as hell. Can I yes. possibly troll you for printing out one of today's? Well, I've got this printer paper yeah, here. Anybody else want a copy of them? Thank you very much. So just the ones for tonight, I'll um, see. I heard you mention in um, one of your videos that uh, that software that you use to New do Cal. 3D graphing is like only available to, go right ahead. How many uh, copies? Yes, one, two, three, four, five, six, okay. 
Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, but is there any way for you to like, post it on D2L for access or anything like that? I don't think I can because we don't have a site license for it. Okay. I don't think it's that, that, that available. Yeah. He had to clean. Oh, did it prompt me for something else? Huh. Yes. Um, sure. No, I don't want to find out. No. <laughs> okay. I don't know if it's going to prompt you for another. No, for a minute. Is the program called NewCal? It's called NewCal. It's actually, you can access it if you're on one of the comps. <laughs> I did this well after the semester is over. <laughs> oh, I can't go to 100. Crap. 99. <laughs> no, it won't let me. So. <laughs> you could also just uncheck the box for it. I know, but I just really don't want it to deal with this. Why is it not printing? It's still not one thing. Did you have the right printer selected? If it won't, I can run upstairs. And oh, yeah, let me double check that. Which printer did it move to? Smart Oh, book. crap. Uh, good call. Here. Uh, yeah, good call. This one is, I guess. Nope. No. There. there is not no there. printer available here. Do you so, want to run upstairs and print them off? Um, just, uh, just. Or no? Just, nah, just okay. let's go on and get started. Get it's started. already 10 minutes in the class, so sorry. Um, but make sure you got. They're up there now, so tonight you might have to be a little bit of a stenographer. But. I will upload these in their you know, unaltered form when I finish with class tonight. So no questions on, on anything we've done so far, or just, just questions in general about the class and the way I do things? Or Okay. If you get to questions like that, that you, you know, don't mean to put you on the spot, but if you get to any kind of questions, feel free to, to ask them anytime you want to, or email them to me, and I can get back to you as soon as possible. Okay. So... Tonight, moving on, this is section 14.7, the calculus three version of finding maximum and mins and maximums and minimums or extrema for a function of, of multiple variables. Uh, we only apply it to functions of two variables, you know, for the for the t test problems that we're doing. But um, what we're doing is we're looking to find these points, this you know sort of local maximum and this local minimum. Um, but in order to locate these, you got to do some kind of Similar version of what you did in calculus one when you set the first derivative equal to zero. Because setting the first derivative to zero tells you the places where you can have a zero tangent line, you know, for your max or for your min. So in this case, though, you're dealing with a three-dimensional surface. So if you remember that picture that I did for you last week where I had the level curves of a surface and I had all these gradient vectors overlap with the surface, okay? Remember, what's the gradient made of? What are the components of the gradient <coughs> for just a two-dimensional gradient? Partial x, partial y. Partial of f with respect to x, and then is your i component partial of f with y is your j component. So when you drag one of those gradients closer to a max or a min, the magnitude of the gradient shrinks down to zero. And when you're at the max or min, <coughs> both partial derivatives actually wipe out. If you, if you want to you know, see why, just looking at the partial with respect to x, let's say you're going in the x direction here, the partial of x just measures the slope of that, that slice, that trace into the surface, this little line right here, that curve, that kind of parabola looking curve. So if I wanted to find that peak point, I could just set the partial with respect to x equal to zero. And that at least locates you know, that, that point. But if you want to guarantee it's a maximum in both directions, you set the partial with respect to y also equal to zero. And it tells you the, it should say the same coordinates, the same places where you had that maximum. So since the gradient's made up of partial with x and the partial with y, when you set both of those simultaneously equal to zero, you're guaranteed to locate any kind of points that where this, this occurs, you know, a maximum or a minimum. So that's the, the rough idea of how to find your maximum ends. Um, and they're referred to as critical points, just like we're in calculus one. Calculus one you call critical points, the values that you get when you set your first derivative equal to zero, and then you can do the first or the second derivative test to see if they're maxes or mins. So we're just gonna extend that one dimension higher to functions of two variables. However, you know, locating the critical points for a function um, creates a system of equations by setting the partial with x and the partial with y equal to zero. These are not the only points that you can find though. Those are the points we're interested in finding, but you'll also be able to locate points like this. 
These are referred to as saddle points, kind of like the, the point in this very center of a Pringle potato chip. Because if you look at the, at the slope in the X direction, you're dealing with kind of a, a slice or a trace that looks like a parabola opening up. Okay, but if you look at the trace in the Y direction, the Y's partial derivative represents a, a parabola opening down. So you kind of have criss-crossed concavity there. In the X direction, that looks like a minimum. But in the Y direction, that looks like a maximum. So there's a little bit of a disparity. At points like this, your partial with X and your partial with Y would both go to zero. So your gradient vector would also go to zero. So simply setting the components of the gradient Sending these two things equal to zero doesn't guarantee you're only going to get the maxes from the mins. You're also going to pick up these saddle points too. That's why you need kind of a filter to figure out which points you have, which ones are maxes, which ones are mins, and which ones are these saddle points. Okay. So first things first, though. Let me show you how to find these critical points. I mean that right there. That's the rudiments of how to find your critical points setting those partial derivatives equal to zero at the same time, and then solving that resulting system of equations. Um, now, a lot of you hear systems of equations, and you may think of the program Simult. How many of you have the Simult program on your calculator? Okay, that only works if the system of equations is linear. If all your variables are raised to the first power, and you can set it up in, a, in sort of a row column matrix format. If you have any, any variables raised to a squared or a cubed or a one over x, that's not linear behavior. So you can't always use the Simul program to solve this system of equations that you create here. So, so be warned. Um, you might get lucky in a few cases and you can use Simul, but, but not always. This first example I've got here, I think is one in which you cannot. So, first things first, when you're doing one of these max-min problems, you've got to be able to find the critical points. And that's what it boils down to. Set the partial of f with respect to x equal to zero, and set the partial of f with respect to y equal to zero, and then solve the system. <coughs> the solution to the system should be a set of xy coordinate pairs. So you're really going to find xy coordinates that represent places in the domain of the surface where you could have a max, where you could have a min, or you could have one of those, um, those Pringle points, those saddle points. But, but they all start with the same kind of process. So you want to take the partial derivative of this function with respect to x. So f partial x, start with a clean copy of it. Um, that's going to give me 2x minus 2y plus 0 minus 0 equals 0. Well, you want to force it to equal 0. We're setting it equal 0 for the purpose of finding you know, the, the x slope equaling 0 in the x direction. You take the partial with respect to y, and you do the same thing. So the partial of, of the original function with respect to y, the x squared wipes out, then you get a minus 2x, and then you get plus 3y squared over 3, so actually the power rule there will cancel the 1 third out. That should become a plus y squared, and then finally minus 3, set equal to 0. If everything here had x and y raised to the power of 1, it's a linear system of equations. And you could use a matrix, put it in reduced row echelon form if you know how to do that. You could use the Simult program if you have it on your calculator, but that only works if this is linear. The y squared right here in the second equation, you can barely see it, sorry, I'm uh, sort of written in, into the tail of that other y. It, that prevents it from being linear. You have something raised to the power of 2. So that means you've got to fall back on algebraic know-how. All right. What you want is you want both of these equations to be forced to zero, and you want to find the values of x and y that make them both go to zero simultaneously. So what that means is sometimes you may have to do some kind of elimination or substitution. For example, um, I'll go ahead and number this first equation, number one, and this second equation, number two. Sometimes that might be handy for, for referring back to them. From this first equation, what I know has got to be true, if, if, if this statement is supposed to be true for whatever my x, y coordinates are, this tells me x has to equal y. Does everybody see how that implies x must equal y? So whatever critical points we get, whether they're maxes, mins, or saddle points, that has to be true. So I know I'm going to have the same x, y coordinate for all the points. So since if you solve that for, for either x or y, it tells you 2x equals 2y. So that implies x has to equal y. 
So everything from left to right is, is still the same version of equation one. All these are equalities the, you know, the, from the same statement. So since I know that has to be true, take this fact and then use it in equation two as a substitution. And that'll help you kind of narrow down what x or y values would, would you know, allow that criteria to work. So sometimes you have to make a substitution to, to guarantee your interlocking and using both facts from both equations. So then either substitution works. Going here, you can replace y with x, or I'll replace x with y. And that'll lead to a one variable equation that you can solve. So take that back and substitute it into equation two. Um, so it doesn't matter who gets replaced with whom. I'll go ahead and replace y with x. And so equation two technically becomes since I replace y with x, it becomes this. y has to equal x, so force that criteria to be true in equation 2. And now this should be relatively familiar territory. It's, it's just a quadratic equation. Um, it's written in a weird form, though. Since that's the same thing as x squared minus 2x minus 3 equals 0, I think this one's actually factorable. So after I made that substitution, I get a couple of solutions, but keep, yeah, everything okay? Raised eyebrows and wrinkled foreheads give me pause, or cause to pause. So everything we got here was based on what fact? Based on what substitution? X equals Y. X equals y. So keep in mind, your critical points for a function of two variables need to be two-dimensional xy coordinates. So you can't really say the, the critical points are x equals three and x equals negative one. You have to go back to this fact, your original substitution, and then link everything together to get two-dimensional critical points. CPs, your critical points, are xy coordinate pairs. So since x is supposed to equal y, we've got one critical point at x equals 3, and the only criteria is x has to equal y, so y has to equal 3, coming from this value. The other one uses x equals negative 1, and that x equals y forces the, the y coordinate for there to be negative 1. So those are our only critical points for this particular surface. Okay. So you got to deal with some algebra. Whenever you're solving one of these systems, it's always going to be a two-equation system because those are the two equations you're generating. And the only variables you'll see are the two variables from the function. In this case, the variables x and y. So in most cases, you can take one of the two equations and make some kind of substitution or even to, to cause you to eliminate one of the variables in the other equation. As long as both equations are kind of blended together to, to get you know, what makes them both true, this should be the solution to that system. In other words, if I go back to this original equation and plug in x equals 3 and y equals 3, I get a true statement. Checks out. I also should be able to plug in x equals 3 and y equals 3 here. Negative 6 plus 9 is 3. Minus 3 is 0. So that coordinate, that xy coordinate 3, 3, works in both equations at the same time. That means it's a viable solution to the system. And for this purpose, it's one of our critical points. Same thing with the other coordinate. You should check it and, and make sure it works in both. Yes. If there was a difference between x and y in the first equation, we would just plug x in, et cetera? If there was a difference between them? Like if x didn't just equal y. Like if x equaled y, y squared, squared or x equaled 2y. Like, yeah. 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 If, if this were x equals y squared, you would go here in the second equation and replace every x with y squared. You'd have negative 2y squared plus y squared. Yeah. And then solve that for y. But then you have to go back. Whatever you get for y here, you have to go back there and make sure you use it to get the other half of the coordinate. Just getting one variable is really half of two critical point coordinate pairs. Okay. And so that's really what you want to do. When you get your answer, double check them both in the original system of these two partials, and they both should work. Negative 1 works in this equation. Negative 1 for x and y here is going to be 2 plus 1 is 3, minus 3 is 0. So I know both of those points work in both of those equations in the original system. They're both solutions. Now, once you've got the critical points, we yet don't know 
if one of these is a max, one of these is a min, or, or a relatively worthless saddle point, you really want to find the maxes and the mins. That's where the, um, the d-test comes in, okay? So, once you've actually found your critical points, the way you determine your maxes and mins is apply this guy. I refer to it as the d-test. Most textbooks do. Um, d is actually a, a calculation using second partial derivatives, okay? And it kind of boils down to this. The, the one thing from calculus one that gave me a lot of trouble was the second derivative test. When I learned it for the first time, it confused me as to why if I've got x equals c is a critical point, if I evaluate f double prime of c, and that equals something positive, do you remember what that implied about your critical point? Does it, does it represent a maximum or a minimum in that case? Yeah, exactly. That's why it was confusing. Mm -hmm. If your second derivative is positive at a critical point, then that means your critical point is sitting at the bottom of a concave up, positive second derivative, a concave up portion of the, of the, fun, of the function's graph. So when the second derivative evaluated a critical point, and again, critical points are your only candidates for these guys right here the max is the mint. When you plug a critical point into the second derivative to get a positive result, you're at the bottom of concave up. So that implies you have a minimum. Or technically a local minimum. Some teachers may have called it a relative minimum. And then conversely, if you take your critical point and plug it into the second derivative, and it gives you a negative result, a negative second derivative indicates concave down. And since we're talking about a critical point, it has to be at the top of a concave down portion. So a negative second derivative there implies a local max. Jared? No. I'm, Did you, I'm I, I swore I saw your hand up, I'm sorry. I was gonna ask a question, but I got answered anyway, so. Oh, okay, okay, cool. And that was kind of confusing to me because positive meaning minimum, negative meaning maximum, you always have to relate it back to the concavity because that's really what the second derivative measures. So you're kind of crossing something you got from the first derivative, a place where your tangent line slope is zero, your first derivative is zero, and then plug it into the second derivative, which measures concave up and concave down. So merging those two together is why the second derivative test is kind of a handy test sometimes. This is analogous to that second derivative test. Okay? It involves taking your critical point, so I'm calling this x sub zero, y sub zero, some generic critical point, like the pair that we got up here in this, this first problem. What you want to do is take each of your critical points that you get and create this expression. Okay? D is found by doing the second partial with x from your original function. And notice, you've already got part of this. The beginning of the d-test, when you find your critical points, you've already got the first partial with x here and the first partial with y there. So you're already on the way to being able to develop this d expression. So d is made up by doing the second partial with x times the second partial with y, and then minus the mixed partial, second partial squared. And remember, which by hook or crook, you can, it says here to do f x y, first partial x, second partial y. If it's easier to do first partial y, second partial x, they both give you the same thing. So that's something worth keeping in mind, which might have come in handy on one of those test problems. Um, as a matter of fact, I think it was the third or the second one. Yeah. I, I ended up doing that. You did that? Yeah, yeah, because if you switch the order, it annihilates half the function right off the bat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you still get the same thing in the end result. So you build this d expression, and then you run it through this kind of filter. Okay. Um, here's the way you translate the d-test, okay? If you, if you take your critical point, plug it into this for x and y, you get a number. If the value of d is positive, and at the same time, if the second partial with x is positive at your critical point, then that means the concavity is up, and your critical point represents a local minimum. But, the reason d is needed here and not just this, I mean, technically, you could also check fyy. If FYY is positive, that means you're still in the Y direction at the bottom of concave up. So really, either of the second partials, FXX or FYY, works here. This, this D expression, kind of considers like the omnidirectional approach to your critical point. From not just the X direction, not just the Y direction, just sort of, the only word I can think of is omnidirectionally. Sort of from all directions. Is it getting toward the bottom of concave up? or is it getting closer to the top and concave down, 
Or is the concavity mixed? Is it concave down in this direction, but concave up in this direction, which would be indicative of a saddle point, the middle of a Pringle potato chip. Um, and if you've never eaten a Pringle, I'm sorry. It's just an analogy you're just not going to get. Um, it's the middle of a saddle. Okay. Um, so that's why you need to check both of these. Check your D value. If D is positive, good to go. And notice that both of these first criteria, D needs to be positive. So if D is positive, it could be a min or a max. That's why you cross-reference it with the second partial X. If X, FXX is also positive, you're at the bottom of concave up, so you have a minimum. If D is positive and the second partial X is negative, you're at the top of concave down. And again, you could check FYY there if you wanted to, for some reason, if it's easier to check. Um, just as long as you're concave down in one of those directions, then you have a local max. The only time you get a saddle point is if D goes negative. If D gives you a negative value, there's no need to check your FXX or your FYY because you're, you, already, you have mixed concavity in, in two directions. And it doesn't have to be in the X or the Y direction only. It could be sort of maybe at 45 degrees from X and Y, maybe in, in this direction and in that direction. But if you get a negative D value, you're guaranteed to have a saddle point because in one direction you're concave down, the other direction you're concave up, and that causes D to go negative. But then there's this sad case. If by some chance, and it's rare that it ever happens, as a matter of fact, in most every textbook I've ever taught from or learned from, I've never seen this happen. If D happens to go negative, the test is inconclusive, which means you probably have to take something like vertical slices or traces into the surface to see if you have some kind of max or min, or maybe look at the level curves and see if the level curves indicate going to a hilltop or going to a valley. You mean zero? If D, did I say negative? Yeah. I mean, yeah, if, if D equals zero, sorry. I may have pointed at one thing and said the other, so, but this is correct, I promise, because I typed it, and it, it's pretty. All right. <laughs> So that collectively is your D test. Okay? So um, let's apply the D test to the critical points we just did. And that's the top of the next page. So I'm still using the same function on this, on this problem. This is the same f of xy. And no spoilers, but the graph is at the bottom of the page. We'll get to that in a second. But um, we're using the same function. So since it's from the previous example, I already know my CPs are 3 comma 3 for x and y and negative 1 negative 1 for x and y. So I'm just going to go ahead and and that's technically the first part of a d-test problem is, is the algebra in solving that system. So they can be kind of algebraically intense problems because you have this huge this little tiny chunk of calculus right here and then big old mess algebra to find your critical points and then you're revisiting the calculus by doing the d-test. Okay. So what you want to do is for each of the critical points you want to evaluate d Let me remind you how it's calculated. Oh, I better be careful if I use of dots in this class. Because some of you may think I'm talking about a dot product, but this is a scalar calculation. So that's the actual calculation of D. I want to evaluate that and FXX if I need to. Because remember, if D is positive, that alone doesn't tell you anything. You have to cross-reference D being positive with FXX being positive or negative. So let's build D. D for this function, and again, this is where it's good to go ahead and keep your, your first part of the problem handy. D is built by doing the second partial with x. So go, go up here where we found our critical points. That equation one right there represents first partial with x. So the second partial with x, fxx, is just the number two. Um, fyy, the second partial with y, would be this thing's partial with respect to y again, which gives me two y and then minus either of the mixed partials squared. Um, all the textbooks always say fxy, so I'll follow suit. First partial with respect to x, take its partial with respect to y, and that's going to be negative 2. But don't forget to square it. So technically your d expression is 4y minus, be careful, you square the negative, but it doesn't change the minus in front. 4y minus 4 is your evaluation of d. 